Hallelujah! Thine the glory, revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to take a detailed look at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, dealing with the days of the Son of Man. Uh, we're going to break this down verse by verse. What is meant by one taken, one left? like in the days of Noah, like in the days of Lot. Uh, we're also going to be tying in uh, chapters of like 28 of the book of Isaiah, chapter 13 of Matthew, chapter 24 of Matthew, and chapter 13 of Ezekiel. Uh, Matthew 13 and Ezekiel 13, and how they play a part in understanding Luke chapter 17. What's going to happen at the climax to the days of the Son of Man? And, and are the days of the Son of Man the same as the day of the Lord or day of the Lord of hosts? Are they different? Uh, let's get right into this lesson. Uh, I've got a Microsoft Office Paint picture that I've done here for you. I'll upload it to the folks that keep and share. I'll give you the link in the uh, narrative in the comment section. I'll probably also upload it to uh, the folks at Google. Uh, for those who do not have Microsoft Office, you're uh, free to, to use this picture file any way that you like. Uh, I hope you'll be using it in your uh, Bible studies. Uh, let's go ahead and read Luke chapter 17 and then we'll look at what I've got on the left hand side of the screen and the right hand side of the screen. So let's read. We'll start at the top. This lesson is really primarily about the it will take and it will pass over of Isaiah chapter 28. It will take and it will pass over. So we're going to be tying Isaiah 28 into this to help us get a better understanding of Luke chapter 17. Again, as well as Matthew 13, Ezekiel 13, and Matthew 24. We're going to start off with verse 11 of Luke 17. Now that's talking about uh, the ten lepers being cleansed. And then notice how G Jesus, the word of God, made flesh, transitions into the coming of his kingdom. Verse 11, now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, this is Jesus, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face and his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. So everything that is given to us in the word of God is given to us for a reason. You know, Jesus, the word of God, is, is showing this ratio for a reason. It doesn't necessarily mean I understand what the ratio is supposed to tell us, but we should take note that only one out of ten who have called out, requested healing, received the healing, all right, took the time to really understand the significance of the answering of the prayers and the receiving of the healing healing, and how they should take the time and get down on their knees and praise Almighty God and truly give thanks and be thankful. And then what happens? They should be continuing to walk in the ways of Jesus and spreading the good news and going to work for the Lord. 
if you're really thankful, spend your remaining days on this earth telling everyone the good news. But it's not looking like 9 out of 10 of them are going to do that. That is really a shame. And is that a true ratio of Christians today that have requested healing and received it and then quickly took it for granted and went back to to their life and and didn't choose to walk with Jesus every day and and be used by Jesus and become blessings to others for the rest of their lives yeah I'd say that the same ratio going on today but let's look at verse 20 the coming of the kingdom now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come he answered them and said the kingdom of God does not come with observation nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. This verse, verse 20 of Luke 17, because it's been misunderstood for 2,000 years, it has caused a lot of denominations to think that the millennial period, which the Bible says will last for 1,000 years, they do not believe that Jesus is going to be ruling in the physical realm during that time here on earth with his bride. A lot of denominations think because of their misunderstanding of this verse, they believe that we're going to be taken to heaven and forever be with the Lord in the spiritual realm. And they, you know, they may believe that we might come back to earth or some other planet after that period and live in the new Jerusalem, but they really honestly believe that we're not going to be uh, living in our new glorified bodies in the physical realm and reigning man of dust nations during that time with Jesus from Jerusalem. They really don't believe it and that they don't preach it. They don't teach it. They'll just use the excuse, well, it's too hard to understand, but I know that when the when I die or if I, I'm alive and remain at his coming, I'll forever be with the Lord in heaven. And they, they really do believe that the kingdom of God cannot come with observation and say, okay, here it is. Now Jesus is ruling the planet, okay, from Jerusalem. So, but what they don't understand, brothers and sisters, is this kingdom of God is different from the kingdoms of this world. Kingdom of God is talking about us being able to access the, the power of Father in, in the spiritual realm and put it to work in this physical realm, use, utilizing that power of God in the spiritual realm. This kingdom of God is not talking about Jesus' kingdom during the millennium. That's the best way to word it. It's not. The kingdom of God can, has been accessed daily by millions of Christians for 2,000 years. But that's not the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom is an earthly kingdom. The kingdoms of this world, the inhabited regions of the planet, will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. I'll show you in this lesson. But because they misunderstood verse 20, they don't believe that the millennium is actually in the physical realm here on terra firma. Verse 22 then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look here, or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part of heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. All right. Brothers and sisters, let me finish reading 
chapter 17, and then we're going to go back and, and, and really dissect each verse and each title by using other scriptures to help us. Verse 25, But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Verse 31, In that day he who is on the housetop, and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed, and one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding together, the one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field, the one will be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, lords? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. All right, so let's dissect these verses uh, dealing with the coming of the kingdom. Again, the kingdom of God is not the millennial kingdom. The kingdom of God is the spiritual realm of the family of God, and we have been able to access the throne of God through Jesus. We've been, act been able to access the power. Father, in the ancient of days, this majesty on high, We've been able to access the throne of God through Jesus Christ and only because we abide in Him. If we abide in Him and He abides in Father, then we can have what we ask for as long as we want it to help uh, do the work of Christ. If you're asking for things that will not help you do the work of Christ, help find the lost sheep, help find your lost family of God members. If you're asking for, for things that just to make your life easier, uh, you're probably not going to receive the answer that you want. But anything that you ask, if it's to further the kingdom, it's to do the work, of your Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, the Holy One of Israel. If that's what you're asking for, you're going to get it. Things that will help you in your work for the Lord. And we are supposed to be doing work. We should be a servant, not a lazy servant. All you should care about is doing the work of Christ. And taking care of others, especially the brethren. And your love for the brethren proves that that is, well, I'll word it this way, that is why Jesus is, has sent you the Holy Spirit that lights your lamp. Your vessel is lit. It glows. The spiritual realm can see it glowing. Because the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you because you are abiding in the love of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Hallelujah. Now, so the kingdom of God is not the kingdoms of this world that at the seventh trumpet shall become. In other words, Daniel 7 tells us that Father at the uh, blowing of the seventh trumpet, makes the announcement that the court that has been in session for 42 months, says Daniel chapter 7, this court that goes into session, Father and the 24 elders, 
Um, you see it there in Daniel 7 when the little horn speaks the blasphemies during the fifth seal. Bam! The court goes into session and the 24 elders and father watch. They watch the followers of Jesus Christ in action during the days of the coming of the Son of Man, which is also called the day of the Lord or the day of the Lord of hosts. It's this time of chastisement on the nation of Israel. And the followers of Jesus Christ who did not flee to the mountains in time, they're going to be caught and snared and will have to give witness. But that's all part of Father's plan to tell the world what he's doing and why he's doing it. Hallelujah. And, and there'll be more martyrs than you could possibly count of the bride of Christ. But don't worry. Jesus is going to bring them out of the earth at his presence when he arrives at the seventh bowl at his great appearing there'll be the worst earthquake of all time throughout the entire planet at the presence of almighty god and the earth will cast out its dead and you will get a new glorified body and it brings father pleasure to have jesus the commander of his army Hallelujah! And his resurrected, exceedingly great army stand on their feet and go to war and defeat the enemies of Christ and of his Father, the Holy One of Israel. But yes, the kingdom of God, uh, think of it like this. If you've ever done a study uh, dealing with the sons of God. If you've ever done that study and you could see uh, a lesson I've done called Giants and the Seed of Satan, uh, where you're in Genesis 6 and it takes you to Job 1 verse 6 and it takes you to Jude verse 6 and then you uh, um, go to, uh, I think it's Matthew 20 and John 8 verse 44 and you, and do, and, and, uh, you do that study of who are the sons of God and you find out that those are angels and the Bible proves that we when we become sons of the resurrection we become sons of God as well okay we will be like angels not identical to angels but like angels so the sons of God were the fallen angels who took uh, the daughters of men as wives and I had to study that for myself because I really didn't believe that what a lot of people were selling was true. But it is true. Maybe not everything they're selling is true, but it is true that the sons of God is talking about angels uh, in the spiritual realm, if you will. And how they, they came into the physical realm, but they were part spirit and part physical. And... Uh, but please see my lesson on that subject. But my point here is that the kingdom of God is talking about uh, something similar to the sons of God. In other words, we're talking about um, not man of dust bodies. All right. But the kingdoms of this world that we see. Let's go ahead and go to uh, BibleGateway.com to look at... Uh, Revelation 11. Revelation 11 in regards to the blowing of the seventh trumpet helps you get a better understanding of the difference between the kingdom of God and the spiritual realm that we've been able to access for 2,000 years, those who abide in Christ, how that differs from what kingdom Jesus is going to be ruling over during the millennium. So you start at verse 15 in Revelation 11, when the seventh trumpet is blown, and remember, the seventh trumpet is blown by the seventh angel, not by um, Lord God Jesus. Did you catch that? The seventh trumpet is not the last trumpet. The last trumpet is blown by Lord God Jesus himself. You see that in Zechariah 9, verse 14. That is the last trumpet. It's the great trumpet blown with the great sound to start the battle of the great day of God Almighty. You got to get that. That's the last trumpet, Zechariah 9, 14, when Jesus appears 
at the pouring of the seventh bowl to fight the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And he is the commander of the Lord's army. Jesus is the one that appeared before Joshua holding the sword. And you see that later on in Joshua too, that this, um, this uh, what he thought was an angel of the Lord is actually the Lord. And you see that throughout that book of Joshua, that Jesus is the commander of the Lord's army, the rider of the white horse. You see in Revelation 19, not the, not the rider of the white horse uh, when the first seal is loosed. That is the Antichrist, the little horn, the vile one, which shall come from the vile city of Nineveh, al mazil Iraq. But here we are in the seventh trumpet, blown by the seventh angel to start the third woe. Remember, the third woe is unleashed before Jesus appears in power and great glory at the seventh bowl on the last day of the age. When the seventh trumpet is blown by the seventh angel, you still have the third woe, which has to be administered. You have approximately 45 days left until Jesus appears, that's the My Assembly of Kingdoms of Zephaniah 3, 8 and the gathering of the nations we see in Joel 3 and, and Matthew 22 and, and uh, uh, Revelation 16 verses uh, uh, 12 through 16. The sixth bowl passage of Revelation 16. But here we go. Don't forget that when the seventh angel blows the seventh trumpet um, there'll be an earthquake in Jerusalem and 7,000 will die and I believe it says what a tenth of the city shall fall and 7,000 shall die as Elijah and Moses the two witnesses are seen standing on their feet raising from the dead after their enemies had killed them and their bodies have laid in the street for three and a half days when Elijah and Moses are seen rising slowly up into the air, and then Father removes the strong delusion, and the ten horned nations uh, turn against the beast kingdom, which shall be headquartered in Baghdad, says Revelation 18, verse 21, which matches Jeremiah 51, verses 62 through 64, and names the Euphrates River. And Zechariah 5 says it's the land of Shinar. And Jeremiah 25 says Shishak Baghdad shall be left for last during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So uh, we know that the Antichrist, the final Antichrist, will come from Al-Mazil, Iraq, Mosul. He will. Nahum chapter 1 is all about the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And Nahum 1 says that that vile one, which shall come from the vile city of Nineveh, shall arise, Daniel eleven twenty one, and take the kingdom by intrigue. So, let's read verses 15 through 19, the blowing of the seventh trumpet, so you understand the difference between the kingdom of God in the spiritual realm versus the kingdom of, these, of the worlds that shall become the kingdoms of Jesus Christ. At the blowing of the seventh trumpet, when the court in Daniel 7 has reached their verdict in favor of Jesus and his bride. This is the awarding of the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. But the time has not come yet to possess the land. You have to form an army and go take it, just like Father has always done. And the extended borders during the millennium of, of uh, these kingdoms that shall belong to our Lord and his Christ, the Bible says that the extended borders will be from the Nile River Basin to the Euphrates River Basin. And interestingly enough, that's exactly what the Word of God says, the location that Jesus and his army will thresh, tread, and trample during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Isaiah 27, 12 tells you um, that Jesus and his army will thresh from Baghdad to Cairo, the channel of the Euphrates River to the brook of Egypt. All right, this Euphrates River Basin and the Nile River Basin. All right, 
and casting out all who offend. Hallelujah. In Zechariah 10, I believe it's verse 12, Zechariah 10 tells you, again, that we're talking about this millennial boundaries of Jesus' kingdom. Now, he'll be uh, ruler of the entire planet. But his primary kingdom will be between the Nile River and the Euphrates River. Zechariah 10 tells you that. Uh, Isaiah 27, 12 tells you that. And many other passages talk about this area. That will be Jesus' primary boundaries of his kingdom. And that's why the Highway of Holies will go from Cairo to uh, um, the Kurdish region of Assyria. All right, that's what's told in the Word of God about the Highway of Holies. And it'll be a straight interstate that'll go just pass through north of the uh, Dead Sea. And it'll go directly straight across all the way to the Kurdish lands of Assyria in northern Baghdad, uh, uh, Iraq. Hallelujah. This All of this stuff is in the Bible. But let's read verses 15 through 19. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world, we're not talking about the spiritual realm, the physical kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now remember, this didn't happen upon Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection. This happens after the court in Daniel 7 reaches a verdict after being in session, Father and the 24 elders, for 42 months watching Satan while he has the authority granted to him by Father to work signs, wonders, and miracles, and to test all who dwell on the earth. In other words, find out who's who. Have Satan come first and draw to him all that belong to him. And they shall be marked with the mark of the beast during this hour of trial test. All right, that's what Father is doing. So the, the uh, not only the 24 elders, but all the host of heaven too can see who really belongs to Jesus and Father. And who doesn't? Okay, in the parable of the sower, Matthew 13 should be coming to mind now about how the three... Um, proclaiming Christians out of four will fall away because they're not rooted in the truth and their seed did not fall on good soil. And the 24 elders who sat before God in their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. This right here is referencing the 24 elders mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. All right, this is, this is the thrones, plural, were put in place of Daniel chapter 7. All right. This is telling you that they have reached their verdict. Father has reached his verdict. The Ancient of Days that Jesus has brought before him in Daniel chapter 7. What does Father announce? We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Boy, that sure references Jesus in his glorified state, doesn't it? Lord God the Son, who came to earth, as Jesus and suffered and died and rose from the dead because you have taken your great power and reigned. Now, when does the millennium start? At the seventh bowl. So why does it say that? You have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead that they watch, brothers and sisters, should be judged. Notice it doesn't say that judgment has come yet. This is the blowing of the seventh trumpet. The dead are not judged until the seventh bowl is poured 45 days later, and that established time shall be shortened by a few days. Hallelujah. But that gives you a no later than date. After you see Elijah and Moses rising from the dead, and the 7,000 people die in Jerusalem due to the earthquake at that time when the earth shaking as Elijah and Moses are seen rising, which is not the rapture of the church. That's just them going up. And it's not a worldwide earthquake, but it will be an earthquake in Jerusalem. When that happens, you know you have no longer than 45 days to wait until the appearing of Jesus Christ. I believe, personally, it'll be more like 
uh, 43 days. Don't know for sure. There's reasons why I say that. But we know due to Daniel chapter 12 that it shall not be more than 45 days following this event. But what I need you to notice here is that the dead has not been judged yet at the blowing of the seventh trumpet. This is not the last trumpet. The last trumpet is held and blown by Jesus himself, the commander of the Lord's army, mustering his army for battle, Zechariah 9.14, Isaiah 13. Um, you got to get that, brothers and sisters. Revelation 19, hallelujah. Joel chapter 3, uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 10, that mustering of the Lord's army to fight. Now, so you're talking about 40 to 45 days later until the dead are judged following the blowing of the seventh trumpet, which is not the last trumpet. Right here, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints. Okay, so some of your wrath has come, but the judging and rewarding has not happened yet. It's a future event. Now, I don't want to harp on that. That's really not what this lesson is about. But you need to notice things like that. The wording of this passage. Okay, this will not happen until Jesus appears in power and great glory. That's not going to happen for about six more weeks. Why? Because Revelation uh, 16, six bowl passage tells you why. And so does Matthew 22. We've got to get the good and bad gathered to the wedding hall to be judged so Jesus can separate the sheep from the goats before the goats are thrown into the lake of fire. Hallelujah. But you need to notice that. But your wrath has come. Well, the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the days of the coming of the Son of Man, which is the day of the Lord, also known as the day of the Lord of hosts. That's the chastisement, all right, that comes upon Israel that many, many nations get caught up in. Why? Because you're talking about um, asteroids and volcanoes and the Mediterranean Sea, one-third of it dying and the wormwood and gall. I mean, there's people caught up in this, not just Israelis. Their neighbors are going to be caught up in it as well. Look at the fifth trumpet, stinging bugs, stinging all who don't uh, have the Holy Spirit in them. Hallelujah. Um, but yeah, I wanted you to notice that. And those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Of course, that destruction comes. When Jesus appears at the seventh bowl, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple and there were lightnings, noise, thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. But uh, my, I brought you here so you see the difference between the kingdom of God, which we've had access to for 2,000 years, versus the physical cities on planet earth, which Jesus is awarded at the pouring excuse me, at the blowing of the seventh trumpet to start this third woe. Remember, the siege of Jerusalem is still going on up until Jesus appears at the seventh bowl, and he stands on the Mount of Olives. Until that happens, the siege of Jerusalem is still going on. But Jesus owns the planet. He's awarded the planet when these 42 months comes to an end, and Father and the 24 elders make this awarding of Daniel chapter 7, but until he shows up, musters his army, and goes defeats his enemies in the entire world, but remember, he's only going to thresh, tread, and trample from the uh, from Baghdad to Cairo. I've already gave you the uh, chapters that explain that, all right? Until that happens, he hasn't rid the land of the enemy. Hallelujah. So let's go back to the picture, uh, the paint picture. Here we are again in Luke chapter 17. But hopefully you understand now what I meant up here in the top left. Note the kingdom of God, like the sons of God, is mainly of the spiritual realm. 
the kingdoms of this world, mainly physical, and will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. In other words, when the Holy Spirit is sent to you by Father, your lamp is lit and the kingdom of God lives inside you. If your lamp is lit, then the overflowing scourged storm that we're going to talk about, this it will take, it will pass over this overflowing scourged storm of Isaiah 28. That will hit Judea and the rest of the Middle East for seven days, starting on the last three days of the sixth bowl period. Will pass over you until Jesus appears and you are taken to the barn, a.k.a. also known as the meat location. This storm will begin by knocking down Jerusalem's siege wall. And that's proven in, uh, you see it, the chapter listed right here, Ezekiel 13. Hallelujah. And that's also alluded to in Zechariah 14, the first two verses, when 50% of Jerusalem is taken into captivity just before Jesus appears to save the day. All right, we'll talk more about the overflowing score storm in a second. Let's go back to this uh, Luke 17 passage. Now that uh, footnote, the top left, was about verses 20 and 21. Now let's make sure you understand the difference between the days of the Son of Man versus the Son of Man will be in his day, or uh, you see it down here in verse 29, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So, let's break this down. Let's, uh, let's go to my easy 70th week of Daniel timeline. I've done on Excel. You see it here, the start of the 70th week. And yes, if you haven't downloaded this yet, you can. I'll have it uh, uploaded to the folks at Keep and Share. You, I'll show you the link. And also, you can, uh, if you'd rather get it from Google as a Google sheet I'll give you the link to that as well in the narrative or the comment section but uh, of course you see all the how long countdowns uh, broken down too that you find in Daniel the book of Daniel uh, as also as, the, as well as the book of Revelation but notice this brothers and sisters the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night begins when the sun and moon goes dark over Jerusalem at exactly noon to signify the loosing of the sixth seal, time has expired on the clock. You find that in Amos chapter 8. It's time for Israel to don sackcloth. They waited too long to denounce Gog possessed by Satan and bow a knee to Jesus. If that happens, Father cannot relent if they do not repent in time. The day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. The days of the Son of Man. That's what this is. This chastisement on Israel. All right. It's also known as the wrath of the Lord of hosts. It actually begins at the blowing of the first trumpet when Gog's army is used as a rod of anger to chastise Israel and the land. Here comes this Assyrian alliance. You see it right here. Who shall help the children of Lot the nations that surround Israel who have the deepest, longest hatred towards Israel. With this Assyrian alliance led by Gog, possessed by Satan, who shall come from Al-Mazil, Iraq. Mosul, Iraq says Nahum chapter 1. This Assyrian alliance of most likely Syria uh, and Turkey and Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia. All right, they're going to help the children of Lot. You know, Lebanon, Jordan, um, and, and don't forget Isaiah 8 says that many nations around the Nile River Basin are going to join with them and join this confederation. All right, uh, you see that in Psalm 83 and of course Ezekiel 38, uh, but I, in Isaiah 8, all the 8s are involved, Isaiah 8 explains it, Ezekiel 38, Psalm 83, all right, this uh, confederation that's going to try to wipe out the name of Israel, led by Gog from Mosul, Iraq. Now, I say from Mosul, Iraq. The Bible doesn't say in Nahum 1 that he's from Mosul, Iraq, but it does say that he shall go forth from Mosul, Iraq. He could be from 
Moscow, he could be from Istanbul, who knows where he's from, Tehran, Cairo, we don't know, but he shall go forth from Mosul, Iraq, that's Nahum chapter 1, all about the battle of the great day of God Almighty, when Jesus appears and renders his fiery vengeance, all right, that's what Nahum 1 is all about, it says that wicked counselor is that wicked prince that Israel shall accept during the fifth seal, this period right here, when the followers of the lambs are being persecuted and killed and tried. And all the holy Bibles in Israel are going to be rounded up. This 390 day period, says Isaiah 32 and Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8. That's that year and some days. The time it takes a baby to grow up and say mama and dad, dad. Remember Isaiah 7, Isaiah 8, and Isaiah 32 is talking about the length of the fifth seal. This testing of Israel. And if they do not denounce Gog, possessed by Satan, and bow an to their true Messiah Jesus by the time that the sun and moon goes dark over Jerusalem, then it's too late. That's a year and some days. And it's also, if you see here in the How Long Countdowns, it's a difference between 1335 and, uh, or excuse me, a difference between 1290 and 1260. That first 30 days when he's just posing as the Prince of Hosts, says Daniel 8. And then Daniel 11, uh, verse 36, now the blasphemies are spoken, and now he's posing as the God of gods. All right, but that total is 390-day period. But, this, but again, in reference to our lesson here in Luke 17, you need to understand that the days, plural, of the Son of Man is the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord of hosts, that shall come like a thief in the night. Why are we told it shall come like a thief in the night? Because it comes suddenly. All right. Now you may say, well, Israel's not at peace during the fifth seal. Oh, yes, they are. They are at peace. Now the followers of the Lamb in Israel are not at peace. But Israel itself is thinking our Messiah has arrived. Kumbaya. All of Abraham's children are living in peace. And this image of peace shall be set up in Baghdad in the land of Shinar, this basket of wickedness, and everyone's going to be bowing to it and taking the mark of the beast. And, oh yeah, for a period of a year and some days, it's peace. Peace for Israel, but it's a false peace. It's not true peace. But the followers of the Lamb are the ones standing on the street corners holding the signs and throwing that Bible up in the air. And saying, you don't know, this is Satan, what are you doing? And guess what? They're going to be killed and tried and persecuted. And uh, But many of them will flee when the abomination of desolation you see right here takes place. At the loosing of the fifth seal. They shall flee to the fords of Arnon. Uh, ravines. There at the southeast corner of the Dead Sea. Now Jordan calls it the Wadi Mujib, but be careful calling it that because Mujib, I found out, is a one of the many names of Allah. But don't let Allah claim it. That is part of the Holy One of Israel's land, and that's where he wants you to go, says Isaiah chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Go to the fords of Arnon. And Moab, you better hide my outcast, my sheltered one, says Isaiah 16, verses 1 through 5. So, I believe if you are in Judea, if you are in Petra, Selah, if you are in the Negev Desert, the wilderness of Judea, you need to flee to the fords of Arnon. But if you want to find it on YouTube, uh, and you want to see a lot of videos of what it looks like, you'll have to type in Wadi. W-A-D-I space Mujib, M-U-J-I-B. But be careful calling it the Mujib because that's a word uh, in, in Islam that describes the false god, Allah. It talks about how he shall be uh, someone who responds to his children's request. All right. But call it the Fords of Arnon. It belongs to... God, it will belong to Jesus at the blowing of the seventh trumpet. So you shall be safe there. Even though uh, many in the Middle East who are enemies of Christ shall call it the rivers of the Mujib. But anyways, 
That's why I brought you here to show you what the days of the Son of Man are. Daniel chapter, uh, well, let me word it like this. If I'm correct that the fifth seal period is 390 days, then from the sixth seal to the return of Christ at the pouring of the seventh bowl is going to be 945 days. Sixth seal to the blowing of the seventh trumpet is 900 days. And the bowls of wrath are 45 more days. Remember, that shall be shortened by a few days, though. Because if not, there'd be no flesh left alive, says the book of Matthew. Hallelujah. Uh, so, this is not a detailed timeline. If you want to go to my very detailed 70th week of Daniel timeline, you'll, you'll see the links for it as well. I didn't want to overwhelm you with this timeline. I call it my easy one, the easy 70th week of Daniel timeline. So I'm not going to break down everything as far as the amount of days per trumpet and, and bowl. But I brought you here to show you the days of the Son of Man. Now, if that's the days of the Son of Man, and that's what's meant by these red boxes here and here, what is meant by his day the Son of Man will be in His day. What is meant by in the day when the Son of Man is revealed? What is meant by that? Well, that's uh, the seventh bowl pouring. When He, the commander of the Lord's army, shows up, is revealed, He appears to muster His armies for battle, says Isaiah uh, 13, Jeremiah 51. All right, Revelation 19, this is when Jesus musters his army for battle. That's uh, the exceedingly great army that stands on its feet. It is a true resurrection of the dead when the earth cast out uh, the dead. And Jesus accesses the power of his Father, that resurrection power. It gives due, life-giving due to the dry bones, all the branches natural and adopted on that tree of life that he is the root of shall receive that resurrection power from almighty god and those who are alive and remain immediately following all within the twinkling of an eye shall be taken to the barn the meat location now where is the meat location i'm not a hundred percent sure I believe it's Bethlehem Ephratha, south of Jerusalem, because remember we're told in Zechariah Zachari 9 that these whirlwinds of the Lord shall come out of the south. All right, plus, where else would the root of Jesse uh, meet his bride but above Bethlehem Ephratha? You know, and I believe that's what Micah 5 is telling us. When Jesus comes a second time as ruler, he shall go forth from Bethlehem. Out of you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, shall come to me, the one, the ruler of Israel, my elect one. So yes, I believe the meat location is above Jesse's house, in, above Bethlehem, south of Jerusalem, these whirlwinds of the Lord. Uh, and and, and uh, chapter 10 of the book of Numbers should come to mind. The first time that the armies of God went northward, as whirlwinds to defeat their enemies in the land of Canaan when they went the first time and the Lord was uh, leading them they went out as four whirlwinds armies all right and that's what Zechariah 9 is alluding to these whirlwinds shall come out of the south uh, but anyways that's the day that he shall be revealed in other words behold I am coming as a thief found in Revelation 16, verse 15, the end of the sixth bowl passage, it says, okay, now it's time for Jesus to come as a thief. All right, quickly, in a moment, in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, that's the pouring of the seventh bowl. That's the day that the Son of Man shall be revealed. But the days of the coming of the Son of Man, that is sixth seal through the end of the sixth bowl. Now that we know that, keep that in mind as you read verses 22 through 30 in Luke 17. All right, let's read this note I have at the top right. Note, days of the Son of Man that you see here in Luke 17 is the day of the Lord period of the 70th week of Daniel. 
In other words, it is the promised curse on the house of Israel and the house of Judah that you see in Deuteronomy 32 because of the oath taken by their forefathers. Therefore, the days of the Son of Man is the 945-day period from the sixth seal through the end of the sixth bowl. Again, we know that from the how long countdowns of Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation uh, 13. When the seventh bowl is poured, we can now say that the days of the Son of Man have climaxed into the day when the Son of Man is revealed, also called his day, that day, or the day. And you'll see that in the book of Thessalonians as well. Uh, here's some lengths of the sixth seal to the fifth trumpet, 360 days. That's the year of their punishment when the uh, leaders of Israel shall have to drink wormwood and gall. Then you have the uh, fifth trumpet length is 150 days. We see that in Revelation. The sixth trumpet period is phase one of the siege of Jerusalem found in Ezekiel chapter 4. And we know that John, the revelator, has to eat the same book as Ezekiel, meaning that the siege of Jerusalem shall happen again, that book of the siege. 390 days is phase one. That's the length of the sixth trumpet period when the 200 million people are going out uh, for the name of Gog. Uh, uh, and they take their orders from the Euphrates River. 200 million are going out to take over the planet. For the little horn, uh, the seventh trumpet period, you have the 40 days uh, of the first five bowls, as well as the sixth bowl, except for the last three days of the sixth bowl. That is represented by 1 Kings 18, these four water pots, these four latter rain water pots that shall be poured three times that shall overflow the trenches and the hiding places before the fire of the Lord is administered by Jesus himself at the pouring of the seventh bowl. So this is a 45-day period which shall be shortened, I believe, by two days. You have the three, and that's a seven-day period, I believe, from the time the overflowing scourge, latter rain, starts pouring until the fall of Babylon, I believe it's a seven-day period. The three days of the sixth bowl, the last three days of the sixth bowl, then you have the last day of the age when Jesus appears, and worst earthquake of all time, and starts administering the fire of the Lord, the refiner's fire, uh, of Malachi 3 and 4, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, the wrath that we are not appointed for, that fiery vengeance of the Lord, Revelation 19. So that gives you four days, and then you have the first three days of the millennium to finish cleaning house, treading, trampling, and threshing the land from the Euphrates River to the Nile River, says Isaiah 27, 12, Zechariah 10, uh, verse 12, I believe. Uh, hallelujah. All right, back to Luke 17. What about the uh, days of Noah and the days of Lot? Well, we see here that uh, the family of God was not taken off of the earth. They were just taken to a safe location. And again, that's what you see for the folks in Judea when the abomination of desolation takes place. That's what Isaiah 16, verses 1 through 5, is talking about. Christians in Jordan... Christians in uh, Judea, all of the followers of the Lamb should be going to the fords of the Arnon River, and they will be considered my sheltered ones, my outcast, and they will be uh, taken care of there, sheltered there by Almighty God. It doesn't matter if they're Jordanian, it doesn't matter if they're Israeli, it doesn't matter if some Americans are there, got caught up in it, get to uh, the fords of Arnon, hallelujah, Isaiah 16, verses 1 through 5. But no, they're not raptured out of the planet into the spiritual realm. This is not the day of their change. It's not the day of their reward. It's not the day of their judgment. Uh, it's not the day that they're taken to the barn. That does not happen until the day that the Son of Man is revealed, hallelujah. So, the flood came. Well, at the end of this age, the flood is actually 
uh, the latter rain. It's the overflowing scorched storm of Isaiah 28. Three days of it followed by Jesus showing up and raining fire and brimstone from the air on all who have the mark of the beast, says Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. All right. Again, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, that rat that we are not appointed for at the pouring of the seventh bowl. Let's go ahead and read some more what I have on the left-hand side uh, here in the blue. Here are some passages in the Bible where you can read about the overflowing scourge storm. I need you to learn that title. Some versions of the Bible call it the overwhelming flood, which is the latter rain flood. It's the Isaiah, excuse me, the first Kings 18 showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. All right, that's what's going to be going on during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, the showdown to see who the real God is. All right, but Father won't be using Elijah to lead the, uh, the Lord's army. Jesus himself will be the commander of the Lord's army. But the overflowing scourge storm will start three days prior to the arrival of Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, brother, that sounds interesting and all, but how in the world can you prove that? Well, Ezekiel 13 proves that. Did you catch what I said? Uh, there's a time period where this overflowing scourge storm is going to be unleashed prior to the return of Christ. Again, Ezekiel 13 proves that. Let's go to Ezekiel 13 uh, using BibleGateway.com. Not going to read the whole chapter, but we are going to read that uh, the first 15 verses of Ezekiel 13. This is future, brothers and sisters. This is what's going to happen to bring in the kingdom uh, of heaven, you can say, to be more correct, when the kingdoms of the world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man. Let's change this to a uh, larger uh, font. I should have done this earlier. There we go. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel, who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. See, this is what's going to go on during the fifth seal. The 390 days of the fifth seal, when all the Christians are being rounded up, these so-called prophets of Israel are going to say that these Christians are lying. They don't even know who the true Messiah is. And they're going to say that they actually heard from, from God. And remember, Gog's going to be in Israel. He's going to be accepted as their wicked prince, their wicked counselor of Nahum chapter 1. And he's going to be working signs, wonders, and miracles. And they're going to think he is the Messiah. He's finally come uniting all of Abraham's children. And it's going to be that time of false peace. All right, this is really upsetting the Lord, and he brings this promise cursed upon Israel at the sixth seal. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit. And remember, the first four trumpets are really against these foolish prophets. These first four trumpets of the book of Revelation, when he's going to make them drink wormwood and gall, like they tried to make Jesus drink when he was hanging on the cross. Whoa, and you may say, well, the Roman soldiers did that. Uh, who do you think was standing next to them, screaming, laughing at Jesus, says Mark chapter 15, laughing at him as he's suffering? Oh, if you are the Son of God, come down now from that cross, right? And they were laughing at him, spitting at him, and they'd already tortured him. Well, that's going to be the sign of the Son of Man. What's the sign of the Son of Man? That vision of Jesus suffering on the cross for those last few seconds or minutes. But guess what? Isaiah chapter 10 says he's going to be seen coming down off of that bough, that, tr that branch of the tree, says Isaiah 10. He's going to be seen coming down from it. That's how Isaiah 10 ends. All right, that's the sign of the Son of Man. And, the, and he leaps off the bough with terror. Oh, they're going to be terrorized. <laughs> oh, what a sight that's going to be in the valley. Jesus leaping down off of the cross, just like those foolish shepherds. 
did back when they killed him. These forefathers of these foolish prophets. That's right, that seed of Satan. All right, generation to generation, they're going to be around torturing the Christians in Israel and Judea. When Gog shows up and accepted by these foolish prophets, this bloodline of the seed of Satan that still flows through the world, they're going to be drawn to Satan, but they sure are going to give the followers of Christ a hard time. Who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O oh, Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the desert. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of the Lord. All right. In other words, when Jesus shows up, you better have uh, stopped Father's wrath from entering into Jerusalem. But Father says here in this chapter, right before I send my son to save the day, I'm going to finish the third woe, chastisement on the nation of Israel. And this third woe is really going to be hard times for those caught up in the siege of Jerusalem. Father is going to put a gap in this siege wall and allow uh, jihad to flood in and take away 50% of Jerusalem. So we're not done reading Ezekiel 13, but you need to remember what Zechariah 14 says. Right here is the return of Jesus Christ. There it is, commander of the Lord's army. All right, this is Jesus. But what happens just before Jesus comes to save the remnant? All right, here we see that 50%. One taken, one left. Fifty percent of the city of Jerusalem must be taken into captivity. How is jihad going to get in through the siege wall to take them away? How is that going to happen? Well, that's explained to us in Ezekiel 13. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the desert. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in the battle on the day of the Lord. They have envisioned futility and false divination. Remember, the day of the Lord is going on at the sixth bowl. But it's been going on since, really, the skies went dark over Jerusalem at the loosing of the sixth seal. It's all the day of the Lord. But 1 Kings 18 alludes to the fact that this latter rainstorm is going to be poured for three times, three days prior to Jesus' appearing so that Jihad can come through this gap in the wall that Father says he's putting in the wall. All right. And these foolish prophets are not stopping him from allowing Jihad to come in and take away 50% of Jerusalem captive just before Jesus returns. And you may say, well, they're only going to be captive for three days. What's so bad about that? Well, you got to remember that the nation of Israel, Zechariah 13 says that during the day of the Lord, right, six seal through the end of the sixth bowl, it's going to result in two out of every three people in Israel dying, says Zechariah 13. That chapter just before Zechariah 14's appearing of Jesus Christ. Zechariah 13 tells you that two out of three people in Israel are going to be dead due to war, famine, pestilence, earthquakes, um, wild beast. All right. And then the other third is going to be taken away as slaves to the beast kingdom cities. Can be anywhere from Izmir, Turkey uh, to, to Baghdad to Cairo. I mean, who knows where all they're going to be taken. I believe that during these three days, they're going to be put on a ship somewhere around Ascalon area or Ashdod or whatever. They're going to be put on a ship and taken to uh, Izmir. Now, see um, my other lessons for that, why I believe that. But they're only going to be there a few days. And then Jesus will appear. And then Jesus will instruct people at the end of the battle of the great day of God Almighty, which, again, lasts for a total of seven days. They'll be instructed to bring... Uh, Israel to Jesus, to Jerusalem. You see that in Isaiah 66, verses 17 through 21. Verse 7, have you not seen a futile vision, and have you not spoken false divination? You say, the Lord says, but I have not spoken. 
That's going to be going on during the, primarily the fifth seal. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies during the fifth seal, therefore I am indeed against you, says the Lord God. My hand will be against the prophets who envision a futility and who divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. Okay, this is talking about the millennium nor and eternity, nor be written in the record of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter into the land of Israel. Why? Because they are the seed of Satan and were drawn to Gog and took the mark of the beast. Then you shall know that I am the Lord God, because indeed, because they have seduced my people, saying peace, again during the fifth seal, when there is no peace, and one builds a wall, okay, which will end up... Uh, uh, being around Jerusalem, and then it'll be used against them during the uh, second and third woes, and they plaster it with untempered mortar, say to those who plaster it with untempered mortar, that it will fall. There will be flooding rain. This is the latter rain, brothers and sisters. This is the overflowing scorched storm of Isaiah 28, and also Isaiah 24 through Isaiah 30. There will be flooding rain, and you owe great hailstones. This is the hailstones of, uh, you read about Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21 during the seventh bull period. Now, I believe that the actual storm will start three days earlier and last 72 hours. Remember the four water pots poured three times, these four whirlwind storms uh, unleashing the latter rain on Israel, and then eventually the Middle East during the seven days of the battle of the great day of God Almighty. These great hailstones up to the size of a Hebrew talent, 66 pounds, shall fall in a stormy wind, shall tear it down. Shall tear what down? The wall, the siege wall. Surely when the wall has fallen, will it not be said to you, where is the mortar with which you plastered it? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will cause a stormy wind to break forth in my fury. This is the overflowing scourge storm, whirlwinds. This is not the whirlwinds of the Lord's army that shall go forth when Jesus appears. These are actually storms. This is not the glorified bride army acting as whirlwinds, fighting the battle of the great day of God Almighty. This is is really the overflowing scourge storm that begins the last three days of the sixth bowl period. Because, remember brothers and sisters, this is important. The, the wall has to be broke down by Father's storm. Then Jihad floods in. Then 50% of Jerusalem is taken away. And the moment we get to the 50% part, which are probably the unmarked ones, I would imagine, being taken away as slaves. Soon as we hit the 50% mark, then Jesus appears, says Zechariah 14. He shall go forth after 50% is taken away, and the 50% aren't taken away until this storm knocks a gap in the wall. Now, do I know for sure that the gap is only there for three days? No, but I do believe that's what 1 Kings 18 alludes to. The four water pots poured three times and overflows the hiding places. Hallelujah. Hopefully you see how I came up with that. Uh, all right, verse 14. So I will break down the wall you have plastered with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that its foundation will be uncovered. Again, this is not the past sieges of Jerusalem. This is about the days of the coming of the Son of Man. It will fall, and you shall be consumed in the midst of it. This is the purifying of Jerusalem by Almighty God Himself, that refiner's fire that shall blow, and, and uh, Jerusalem shall become a true furnace. This is not the furnace of war when buildings are on fire. This is the Isaiah 30, verses 27 through 33, this a uh, plague of fire and brimstone that comes out of the mouth and nostrils of Jesus himself. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Because you'll see him. You'll see the face of him who sits on the throne as it's coming out of his mouth. Thus will I accomplish my wrath. This is, don't forget the it is done. In the 6th and 7th bold passages of Revelation 16. It is done. 
Thus I will accomplish my wrath on the wall and on those, that's Jerusalem's wall, and on those who have plastered it with untempered mortar, and I will say to you, the wall is no more. Uh, nor those who plastered it, verse 16, that is, the prophets of Israel who prophesy concerning Jerusalem and who see visions of peace, talking about the fifth seal, for her when there was no peace. There is no peace, saith the Lord God. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 13, it's really important in understanding what's going on at the tail end of the sixth bowl, just before Jesus appears and saves the remnant and starts the battle of the great day of God Almighty at the pouring of the seventh bowl. Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of Luke 17. Let's go ahead and finish it because you're going to find this interesting. What's meant by in that day in verse 31. See it? And in that night of verse 34. We got to finish uh, talking about this. And there's a reason why, Father... Or why Jesus, the word of God, made flesh. Why did he call it in that day, here, and in that night, in verse 34? There's a reason why he, he tells us everything. And it's up to us to try to search the scriptures to find out the true meaning. Verse 31, in that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. So verse 31 is about in that day. And should we separate that from the remainder of Luke chapter 17? Well, in Matthew 24, it talks about in that day. Let's read the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the screen. Verse 31 here is not referring to the destruction of the wicked at the end of the age when Jesus appears. Here, our Father is telling us that when you see the fifth seal abomination of desolation event in Jerusalem, you are down to just a few days to get into the wilderness away from the wicked. That's the fleeing of Matthew 24. When Satan possesses the mind and body of the Antichrist, it will be too late. Okay, do you remember my timeline? The fifth, the fifth seal timeline. Remember, you have the initial 30 days. Daniel 8 says he'll be playing the Mahdi, the Prince of Hosts, the Messiah. Right? He'll be playing that role for 30 days. That's the difference between the 1290 and the 1260. They both count down to the blowing of the seventh trumpet. But the 42 months uh, begins when the blasphemies are spoken. Daniel 11:36. Here, Daniel 11, 29, these five verses before that, he's only playing the Prince of Hosts, the, uh, the Messiah or the Mahadi. All right, that's your chance to flee into the wilderness before uh, the authority of Satan, uh, before Satan shows up with the authority granted to him to make signs, wonders, and miracles and to really persecute the church. But here is when the foolish prophets are persecuting him. All right, Satan has not arrived yet. You have that initial 30 days to get into the wilderness. I believe that uh, you should go to the Fords of Arnon if you're in that area of the planet. Based on Isaiah 16, verses 1 through 5. Uh, continuing on with the bottom left. When Satan possesses the mind and body of the Antichrist, it will be too late. You will be stuck like Chuck. The fifth seal will be a time of testing of Israel by Father. He wants to see if they will denounce Satan and bow a knee to their true Messiah, Jesus. If they persecute the bride of Christ, then Father will bring the curse upon Israel called the days of the Son of Man or the day of the Lord at the sixth seal. The bride of Christ will be sheltered in Jordan's Wadi Mujib if they make it in time. Again, don't get in the habit of calling that because of course Wadi means the rivers, but Mujib is another name for Allah. Okay, so call it by the name that Isaiah 16 calls it. The Word of God calls it the fords of the Arnon River. Call it that, but you need to know that if the Jordanians who are going to be, the Christians in Jordan are going to be helping you get there. Okay, they've been assigned that task. 
All right, that's what Isaiah 16 says. They will be assigned that task. They know it as the Wadi Mujib, but call it what the Word of God calls it, the fords of the Arnon River, because it belongs to the Holy One of Israel. Hallelujah. So, isn't it interesting that in that day is talking about the start? Okay, that's talking about the start of the days of the uh, of the coming of the Son of Man. But if you keep reading in Luke 17, now in verse 34, it says, I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed, and one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together, the one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field, the one will be taken, and the other left. Now, see how it transitions from in that day to in that night. Uh, let's read what I have over here. In uh, uh, right bottom right-hand side of the picture. In that night, verses 34 and 35, this now is referring to the climax of the days of the Son of Man, or the day of the Lord, the climax being the return of Christ to judge and to render his fiery vengeance on all his enemies who must be purged from his kingdom. Many places in scripture states that Jesus will return at twilight during the time of the evening sacrifice. Did you know that, brothers and sisters? Well, we're not supposed to know the day or the hour. I hear you. And we don't know what day he's going to return. Even when the seventh trumpet is blown, we don't know for sure what day Jesus is going to return, but we do know that it will be no longer than 45 more days. But we are told, brothers and sisters, you cannot deny it. We are told in many places in Scripture, and I show two of them here, that uh, Isaiah 17, verse 14, and Zechariah 14, verse 7, uh, tell us that the fire of the Lord will be administered on all those who offend at twilight evening time. It shall happen. That destruction and consuming, all right, that refiner's fire, that plague of Zechariah 14, 12. We're told that it will be unleashed at twilight evening time. On the last day of the age, the last hour of the last day of the age, boom, now it's time to fight the battle of the great day of God Almighty, and Jesus shows up in person. Hallelujah. One taken, one left could be referring to multiple things. Pay attention, brothers and sisters. You see the brown line here. Jesus cannot return until 50% of Jerusalem goes into captivity once Father's storm breaks a gap in Jerusalem's siege wall, allowing jihad to flood in and take away the unmarked inhabitants. We saw that. You read it for yourself in Zechariah 14, the return of Jesus Christ. But what else could one take and one left? Uh, what else could that mean? Well, you see here in footnote 2, only half of the unmarked inhabitants have their lamps lit. Jesus will permit the half who don't know him to come to know him during the millennium. They must be removed before the furnace comes. So you saw in Zechariah 14, Jesus has already appeared. He's already glorified his bride. He's already mustered his armies for battle. And after he has done all of that, he's still allowing uh, inhabitants of Jerusalem to flee through the mountain valley pass. Remember uh, Zechariah 14? Again, this is after the glorification process. There's still people in Jerusalem who don't have the mark of the beast. He's bringing them out. Do you see that? And he's taking them to Bethany, called Azal, Isaria on Google Earth today. All right, this is the fl the fleeing. This is not the fifth seal fleeing at the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24. This, or Isaiah 16, this is the fleeing after he appears and he's getting ready to blow fire on Jerusalem to purify. All right, now they need to flee Jerusalem because he's about to uh, ignite it with the breath of his nostrils, says Isaiah 30, verses 27 through 33, Revelation 14, 
verses 9 through 11, that 9-11 passage of Revelation 14. This is the Malachi 3, Malachi 4. This is Zechariah 14, 12. You see it down here. Uh, in verse 12, it, it tells you what it's going to be like when Jesus unleashes this fire and brimstone out of his nostrils. It's going to be like the same thing that happened to Lot's wife. Every bit, every micro fragment of dew, of life-giving moisture, has been evaporated out of the bones of the wicked once Jesus comes. Just turned to a pillar of salt, just taking away life out of their bones. Hallelujah. So, one taken, one left. Well, we know that um, this 50%, right? One taken, one left. Does, does it mean 50%? Well, that's why Zechariah 14 comes to mind. What else comes to mind when we think about the 50% ratio? Well, what about the, uh, the virgins? The 10 virgins and five were ready and five were not ready? That comes to mind. Okay, that's dealing with the return of Jesus Christ also. We saw that in uh, uh, Matthew 25. Okay, the bridegroom is coming. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now remember, when you're talking about the Son of Man is coming, there's the days of the coming of the Son of Man. All right? That's going to catch everyone in Israel by surprise at the sixth seal. When darkness falls over Jerusalem, that signifies it's too late. And you're going to say, but surely, if Gog, the little horn possessed by Satan, is in Jerusalem during the fifth seal, 390 days of the fifth seal, if he's there and this time of false peace has come, surely people in the world will not be taken by surprise when the days of the coming of the Son of Man begin at the loosing of the sixth seal. Remember, the wrath of the Lord of hosts begins, the curse and the oath that shall pass over seven times, the seven trumpet judgment shall begin. Surely, if all of that uh, signs, wonders, and miracles and abomination of desolation event has taken place, how in the world can the sixth seal come suddenly in an instant in the twinkling of, uh, not twinkling of an eye, I'm sorry, suddenly in a moment? How can the sixth seal and this curse and this Gog's Assyrian alliance making war against Israel and, and coming through the uh, airspace of Israel, how can all that be a surprise? Well, it's not to the Christians. Did you see that? Okay. When the abomination of desolation takes place, it will not be a surprise to the true followers of Jesus Christ who knows the Holy Bible. It won't be. All right. Many will flee to the uh, safety of the fords of Arnon. Many won't make it out in time. They'll be trying to prepare. Well, I have to go get all of the wet suits for my children. We have to gather up our water. We have to go do all of this, do all of that. I've got to double check that the Wadi Mujib is the right place. Well, you should, because I could be mistaken. All right. But one thing's for sure, we're told flee to the mountains, flee to the mountains now. Don't look back. Don't wait. 
And you may say, well, is Jesus getting ready to blow fire on it in the fifth seal? No. He blows fire on it, though, during the day of the Lord that comes as a thief in the night, the days of the coming of the Son of Man. During that time frame, which is actually, I believe, uh, 945 days shortened by a couple days, all right, he will be blowing fire on it. But you may say, well, why is there that big rush to get out of there now at the abomination of desolation? Because if you don't get out of Judea now, you're not going to be able to get out of Israel and out of Jerusalem. Why? Well, unless you have the mark of the beast, you're not getting out. You get it? All right. You're stuck like Chuck. There's no, oh, well, I'm going to go down to the airport and get on a plane or I'm going to go get on a boat. Oh, no, you're being checked for the mark everywhere you go. Once the mark of the beast gets unleashed in Israel. But you're right. Revelation chapter three says that and I'm paraphrasing to the followers of the lamb. This won't come as a surprise. All right. And you're like, wow, you're really paraphrasing that. Well, we let's go to Revelation 3. So we can see exactly how that's worded. That proves that to us this won't come as a surprise. Here we go. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know the hour I will come upon you. Did you see that? Isn't that interesting? What does that mean? Well, you can paraphrase it however you want, but if you do watch, Jesus will not come upon you as a thief. What is that talking about? I will not, I will come upon you as a thief if you don't watch. I will come upon you. What is that talking about? It's talking about the day of the Lord, the days of the coming of the Son of Man coming upon you. It's not talking about the moment he returns at the seventh bowl. It's talking about the day of the Lord. In other words, you're stuck like Chuck in the land of Judea, in the land of Israel. You're stuck. Okay? You've waited too long to get out. But if you watch and know that the abomination of desolation is your signal to flee and you get out in time before you're stopped. All right. That's what Revelation 3.3 3 is talking about. I come upon you means the day of the Lord comes upon you. The days of the coming of the Son of Man. Plural, 945 days. You say, well, that sure gives us a long time to get out before Jesus blows fire at the seventh bowl. Again, you don't get out right away. They're stopping you at the borders. They're stopping you at the uh, um, airport. They're stopping you at the seaports. You're not getting out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Unless you're bound in need of Satan, you're not getting out of there. I hope that helps you, brothers and sisters. But again, the one taken, one left. It could be referring to uh, the 50% of Jerusalem that must go into captivity just before Jesus goes forth. Or it could be uh, referring to, um, you know, what the passage about the virgins, the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins, uh, who Jesus will know, who he will not know, you know people getting caught up and taking the mark of the beast and they thought they were uh, taking the mark of the Messiah but it turned out to be God, uh, uh, the false god Satan <laughs> you know they didn't have the understanding of, of what was going to happen to these things that shall take place they didn't really understand Satan has to come first that's why it must be taught in your churches brothers and sisters that Satan is sent first to, so that all of the seed of Satan can be drawn to him and take his mark. So the perjurers, the false uh, witness ones, shall be marked for destruction. Then Jesus shall go forth at the climax to the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Hallelujah. Now let's uh, go get a better understanding of Isaiah 28 to end this lesson. That's really what this lesson is about. All right. This right here. 
it shall it will take it will pass over what is that all about let's go to Isaiah 28 but before we do let's uh, read the blue here again here are some passages in the Bible where you can read about the overflowing scourge storm that Lord God Jesus will use to bring about the fall of the Babylonian Assyrian kingdom beginning on the last three days prior to Jesus' appearing on the last day the seventh bowl and I list the uh, in the blue the chapters that will help you Isaiah 28 Revelation 16 verses 17 through 21 Isaiah 24 Chapter 25, chapter 26, 27, 29, 30, Ezekiel 13, Psalm 58, Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs 10, Isaiah 17, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 48, Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 30, Amos 1, Zechariah 9, Job 21, Psalm 83, Psalm 148, and Nahum chapter 1. All of those passages will help you understand the latter rain at the end of the age, the overflowing scourge storm. Uh, also, by some versions call it the overwhelming flood. That's what uh, 1 Kings 18 showdown with the prophets of Baal was alluding to. All right. That brings about the, the return of Jesus Christ. So let's read Isaiah 28 to end the lesson. Don't worry, we're not going to read all of Isaiah 28, but it's the best chapter to go to to understand the it will take you and it will pass over. This overflowing scourge storm unleashed a few days before Jesus is appearing. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's start reading at verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was to them precept upon precept, uh, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken, snared, and caught by the devil who shall be sent forth. This is the great falling away that shall occur. Three-fourths of the proclaiming Christians who are not rooted deep into the truth shall fall for the lies of Satan and shall take the mark of the beast thinking he is the Messiah. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men. Verse 14, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we are in agreement. In other words, this is the believing that Gog, the little horn possessed by Satan, is their true long-awaited Messiah, bringing peace to all of Abraham and Israel's children. It will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. In other words, pay attention, brothers and sisters, during the fifth seal, when all of the Christians in Israel are being brought on trial because they're screaming at the top of their lungs, that's Satan, that's Satan, that's Satan. Okay, they're going to be scourged, put on trial. The Holy Bible's rounded up. The church of the Holy Sepulchre shall be burned to the ground. All of the holy places shall be defiled, and the churches with crosses on them shall burn. Okay? That's what Isaiah 28 is talking about. Father's letting you know why he's going to do what he's about to do. He calls them scornful men. All right? Allowing uh, Israel to bow towards Baghdad so many day, uh, times a day, that land of Shinar where that basket of wickedness shall be set up, and the curse shall go out through Israel. The mark of the beast, uh, Daniel 11, verse 39, that advancement and acknowledgement of the beast kingdom in Israel and throughout the Middle East and then eventually the world. Therefore, verse 16, thus saith the Lord God. Let's go ahead and turn this up to a uh, larger font. Here we go, verse 16. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily and take the mark of the beast, even if it means your baby having milk. He can't buy and sell without the mark. And all of your religious leaders in Israel is going to be telling you, don't worry. Father has stopped the curse and sent our true Messiah. That's what you're going to be told in Israel and around the world. Father has stopped the curse in the oath. It's not coming. This is not Satan. This is Jesus. And look, his prophet, his false prophet is going to be bringing fire down from heaven, lighting the sacrifice. Surely this is the work of Almighty God. That's why you got to know your Bible. And he'll point to 1 Kings 18 and go, look, all right, only the true God can bring fire down from heaven. That's what's going to be told. And you're going to have Elijah and Moses that are on the scene too. They're going to be trying to wake you up to the truth, but you won't listen. Here we go. Here's this storm that Ezekiel 13 is talking about. That happens at the uh, end of the tail end of the sixth bowl period. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. Remember, this is talking about this siege wall that was built probably during the fifth seal around Jerusalem. Father's bringing this to mind. Remember this wall built with untempered mortar? The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. What hail? The hail of the uh, latter rain, the overflowing scorched storm. And remember, it grows to the size of 66 pounds. The Hebrew talent mentioned in Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21. And the waters will overflow the hiding places. That was represented in 1 Kings 18. The pouring of the four water pots poured three times. That was so much water that's going to come into Jerusalem. It will overflow all the bunkers. Remember the trenches? Overflowing the trenches of 1 Kings 18. Your covenant with death. Okay. This accepting the mark of the beast. Thinking that he is the true Messiah. Your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through. All right, passes through. Because now in regards to passes through, remember, uh, Satan passes through the land as an enemy of Israel, starting at the blowing of the first trumpet. He's tricked them. He's fooled them. All right. He's going to literally attack them with the Assyrian alliance, helping the children of Lot. Here they come. He's going to pass through them, acting as Father's rod of anger. Father's going to be purposing this and chastising the nation of Israel and the land. All right, he'll be passing through. Now, at the end of the sixth bowl, the overwhelming Flood or overflowing scourge shall pass through the land for all seven days of the fall of Babylon. But it'll go out first, those first three days. Then on the fourth day, at evening time, twilight, here comes Jesus, and he'll muster his exceedingly great army to finish the battle of the great day of God Almighty. There's four more days left out of the seven-day fall of Babylon. But it begins with the end of the sixth bowl's overflowing scorched storm that shall uh, overflow the hiding places. Father uses this storm, Ezekiel 13 says, and breaks a gap in the Jerusalem siege wall, allowing jihad to get in there before the waters get too high and take away 50% of Jerusalem. Then you shall be trampled down by it, as often as it, they're talking about the overflowing scorched storm, as often as it goes out, it will take you. Okay, that's what's meant by the title, it will take you, all right? It will take, it will pass over. 
as often as it goes out, it will take you for morning by morning. See, it lasts more than one day. In fact, I believe it's the three times of First Kings 18, 72 hour period. For morning by morning, it will pass over. And by day and by night, remember the water is going to get so deep it will overflow the bunkers. It will be a terror just to understand the report. Imagine a 66-pound hailstone falling on your nice Mercedes. <laughs> For the bed is too short to stretch out on. Remember the, uh, the two men laying in bed? For the bed is too short to stretch out on. In other words, you ain't going to be sleeping. You're going to be wondering where the whirlwinds are coming next. And the covering so narrow that one cannot wrap itself in it. For the Lord will rise up at Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon. That he may do his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. Now therefore do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a destruction determined even upon the whole earth. Okay, this is not some past event, brothers and sisters. This is our future. This is at the end of the, of the age. All right? It will pass over. Did you see that? Now, do you have to put uh, lambs, Passover lambs, blood on the doorpost and over the lentil? I don't believe so. Why? Because you abide in the lamb. You've already accepted the gift of his blood. All right? You're in Christ. Now, will you be um, glorified on the fourth night when Jesus appears on the last day of the age? Yes. But you must hide yourself for a little moment. These 72 hours before Jesus appears at the pouring of the seventh bowl. These are the last 72 hours of the sixth bowl period when you should hide yourself for a little moment. Okay, now what about those people who are unmarked inhabitants of Jerusalem that shall be led out through the mountain valley pass are they are they considered my people yes why because they will become family of God members when they come to the knowledge of who Jesus is during the millennial teachings and notice they're not they did not recognize Gog as their shepherd they did not take the mark of the beast because believe me they will not be let out of Jerusalem by Jesus and King David and his army. They won't be allowed to be led out of the gate of Jerusalem when Jesus arrives. That's Zechariah 14, if they have the mark of the beast. But they weren't glorified. That's why they are still in their man of dust body. So he still considers them Israel. They are not seed of Satan. They did not take the mark of the beast, but they did not understand who Jesus was. They did not know him. Do you get it? But they're let out of the city before Jesus blows fire on it, and they will be making babies, beautiful babies, throughout the millennium. Hallelujah. Generation after generation after generation, they'll come to the knowledge of Jesus. All right, they'll go to heaven to serve Father until the great white throne judgment. But on this night, they were not, uh, their lamps were not lit in time. Hallelujah. All right, so does that mean that the 50% that are taken into captivity? Um, well, we already covered that. The one taken, one left. It will be a terror just to understand the report. For the bed is too short to stretch out on. Okay, we already read that. Hallelujah. So, brothers and sisters, I hope that gives you a better understanding of the last um, seven-day period of the age, beginning with the overflowing scourge storm. You see it here in blue. That's the four latter rain water pots poured three times. And you... Uh, uh, a question that should be coming to mind is, brother, are you sure that the overflowing scorched storm does not start at the pouring of the seventh bowl? Well, I don't believe it starts then. I believe it starts three days earlier. And here's why. Because Jesus, when he appears, you have the worst earthquake of all time. That's when the earth cast out its dead. Hallelujah. But remember, Jesus does not appear until after 
50% of Jerusalem goes into captivity by jihad. And who lets them in? Who opens the door for jihad? Father's storm does. Remember Ezekiel 13? Father's storm lets them in. Why? Because 50% must go into captivity before Jesus goes forth on the last day of the age. All right? And Zechariah 14 says that. So I don't believe the overflowing scourge storm, which opens the door for jihad, occurs at the seventh bowl. It has to happen prior to that. All right? But now these storms will continue for the last four days of the seven-day battle of the great day of God Almighty. Remember, Jesus and his army will thresh, tread, and trample from Baghdad to Cairo. Isaiah 27, 12, and Zechariah 10, I think, verse 12. Hallelujah. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope this lesson of Luke 10 explained. It will take, it will pass over. It's been a blessing to you. Don't forget about what Matthew 13 says. You know, remember the tares shall be bundled first, the seed of Satan that shall flock to Gog, the little horn possessed by Satan. They'll be drawn to him and take the mark of the beast. The bundling of the tares, right? Uh, they're bundled in the wine press uh, in the Valley of Armageddon. They're bundled inside of Jerusalem as they flood in to try to take over Jerusalem. They're going to be burned after Jesus gets out. All who are not meant to be burned, who don't have the mark of the beast, but were not glorified. And also, Jeremiah 49, 50, and 51 talk about the bundling of the tares in Baghdad, Babylon, the great city. All the passages are blocked. All right, then Jesus shows up and blows fire. All right, that's also part of the bundling of the tares. And that wheat will be taken to the barn. I believe the meat location is above Bethlehem Ephrathah. Then comes the destruction of the tares. It can be via the storms. It could be via the weapons of indignation armies made up of manna dust armies. The bride glorified bride armies. It could be made up of the storms. And then don't forget the burning of the tares. Hallelujah. The great furnace. Brothers and sisters, I hope this blessing has been a blessing to you, and I can't wait to see you next time. God bless.